a dress for the party. Awesome. Not really. I went to try it on, but Emma, there was a man in there. A man? I told customer service, but they said, it's our policy. What? Target allows men into women's restrooms and changing areas. The American Family Association is calling for a boycott of Target until they reverse this misguided policy. Sign the pledge at AFA.net. This is American Family Radio, a listener-supported ministry of the American Family Association. American Family News, I'm Robert Thornton. The Biden administration remains accused of being soft on crime, especially when it comes to illegal immigrants arrested for crimes against American citizens. This is an exchange today between Fox's Peter Ducey and White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre. Why isn't federal immigration law tougher on border crossers who come here and are accused of serious crimes? So, um, are you speaking of a specific case? There's this story in New York, an eight-person crew of border crossers found with drugs and guns. Six of them now are out on bail. Does President Biden think policies like that are making the country safer? So I want to be really careful. That's an active case, so don't want to comment on an active case. But anyone found guilty, and we've been very clear about that, anyone found guilty of a crime should be held accountable. We have been very, very clear about that. According to Border Report, Texas continues to criminally charge illegal immigrants who are accused of cutting razor wire placed along the Rio Grande. First Lady Jill Biden snaps at the mention of a poll that shows the president trailing Donald Trump in six swing states, Fox News reports. She made the comments during an appearance on CBS Mornings Today and was specifically questioned about a recent Wall Street Journal survey that found the Democrat incumbent is trailing former President Trump. He's losing in all the battleground states. That... No, he's not losing in all the battleground all but one. states. He's coming up, and he's um, uh, even or doing better. So, mm. you know what? Once people start to focus in and they see their two choices, mm -hmm. it's obvious that Joe will win this election. NBC News previously reported that the president began to shout and swear in a January meeting when informed that his poll numbers had dipped in the battleground states of Michigan and Georgia over his handling of the Israel-Hamas war, according to a lawmaker familiar with the situation. People in the pro-life community are sometimes criticized for only caring about babies. But Emily Davis of Susan B. Anthony Pro-Life America says that's not true, and a case we're still waiting on for a Supreme Court decision is proof. At issue is whether the FDA erred in lifting restrictions on abortion drugs. This case absolutely shows that we care about the women. In fact, it's a lot of women doctors that are leading this because a lot of their patients, women, are coming forward and saying, I have been harmed, saying, why was I left to DIY self-manage an abortion at home? She went on to say abortion supporters used to say things such as safe, legal, and rare, but that's not the case today. The push to normalize sexual deviancy continues across society and in our nation's colleges and universities. Here's AFN's Bronson Woodruff. Syracuse is a private university in Syracuse, New York. It just hosted its annual Trans Support Day in March. Campus Reform reports the event features local, quote, gender-affirming care providers, legal support for name and gender changes, and programming for children like advocates of gender-affirming surgery, end quote. Zachary Marshall is editor-in-chief of Campus Reform. I have to say that I went to Syracuse University for my master's and I'm deeply disappointed in my alma mater for doing this because it provides the same resources to transgender students that are already available to them through the LGBTQ Resource Center. He said this is not necessary. In fact, Marshall sees it as quite the opposite. I see it as a complete waste of resources and time to put on yet another event for the transgender community there when they already have, when Syracuse already has, you know, events going on in October, March, and June for the same group of people. He thinks this is part of a trend we're seeing across the U.S. and higher education. Campus reform has covered uh, for years now. More, there are more and more weeks and more and more months are being devoted to uh, the LGBTQ left. And this trend was just taken off campus and made national when Biden made Easter Sunday, Transgender Day visibility. I'm Bronson Woodruff. Fox Weather reports an untimely severe weather event may threaten the skies over North Texas Monday as millions hope to take in the spectacle of the total solar eclipse. The Storm Prediction Center has issued an early severe weather risk for Monday for North Texas, southern Oklahoma, and parts of southwest Arkansas and northwest Louisiana. For American Family News, I'm Robert Thornton.
No part of our life can be left unprotected or exposed. The Bible doesn't tell us to choose four or five out of these pieces of armor, whichever ones we want, and to implement them. No, we are told to put on, notice, the whole armor of God. Join Dr. David Jeremiah for his series, Spiritual Warfare, Armor of the Believer, next time on Turning Point. 5.30 a.m. and 7 p.m. Central on American Family Radio. Darkness is not an affirmative force. It simply reoccupies the space vacated by the light. This is the Hamilton Quarter on American Family Radio. It should be uncomfortable for a believer to live as a hypocrite. Delivering people out of the bondage of mainstream media. And the philosophies of this world. God has called you and me to be his ambassadors. Even in this dark moment. Let's not miss our moment. And now, the Hamilton Corner. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Hamilton Corner here on American Family Radio. I'm your host, Abraham Hamilton III, joined by the corner contingent. <laughs> and we're ready to rock and roll with today's edition of the program. Thank you to all of you guys who uh, prayed for us yesterday. We ended up having to uh, shut down our offices early yesterday uh, due to an inclement weather threat. So uh, I had to do some things to batten down the hatches unexpectedly uh, shortly before uh, coming on the air. So that's why I wasn't on live yesterday. But thanks be to God uh, that I am able to be with you here today at this very <laughs> moment. <laughs> Many of you, if not most of you, are transitioning from your part-time jobs where you generate an income to your full-time jobs where you cultivate an outcome. And as you do so, I want to remind you to do so with intentionality, understanding the primacy that God places on family. There are lots of things that vie at our attention that can distract us from time to time. <laughs> but it's vitally important that we understand the primacy that God places on family. It's easy to become consumed in the things that are swirling around us, but we have to understand the main thing must remain, remain the main thing. That main thing, first and foremost, being the Lord and his gospel. In addition to that, or I should say beside that, it is then our personal commitment to him in faith. First and foremost, for regeneration, for eternal life, salvation. Then, confidence in him, as Paul told the Colossians, that if we will trust him, uh, just as we were found in him, built up in him, so let us walk in him. That is an exhortation uh, for the phenomenon that I've explained, that if we can place our faith in him for eternal life, then why would we come up short with placing our confidence in him for navigating the here and now. He's worthy of it all. He's worthy of it all. I also need to mention that the season of where in the nation will A be next has, has begun. <laughs> I have some, some events that I have to sh share that are not public events. Some of them our private events, but then we have other events where the, where a general uh, invitation can be offered. Some of those general invitation events, uh, June 6th through the 8th at the Greater Richmond Convention Center in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, I am honored to participate in the 41st Annual Virginia, Virginia Homeschool Convention uh, put on by the Home Educators Association of Virginia. Uh, Heave. It's going to be an amazing time. This will be my first time participating there, which I'm really, really looking forward to, um, including participating in the pastor's workshop, workshop where uh, pastors are invited. If you're in the Virginia area, willing to come to the area, you are invited to register free of charge, no charge at all, uh, to come to the event to see why the home is the base for education, why it must be viewed in that fashion and how we can uh, support that reality. Similarly, the very next week, uh, June 13th through the 15th, I'll be joining uh, the, the Rocky Mountain Homeschool Association, the Rocky Mountain Homeschool Conference in, in Denver, Colorado. It's going to be an amazing, amazing time there as well. Uh, then we will have in July, in July, at Faith Baptist Church in Bartlett, Tennessee, the Culture Proof Conference, 
uh, where we will be traveling. And I should have mentioned in Virginia, J-Mac will be there as well. So if y'all want to come and harass J-Mac, I would encourage you to do so in, in Richmond as we'll be broadcasting live from there. Uh, but in July, July 18th through the 20th, at the Culture Proof Conference, it's going to be an amazing time. If you're watching this show, you, you'll you see the flyer there. Uh, well, I'll be joining wonderful, wonderful people, Dr. Kathy Cook, uh, Dr. Renton Rathbun, world, Biblical Worldview Professor at Bob Jones University, Dr. Jason Lyle, uh, who is an apologist, uh, who also happens to be an astrophysicist, like for real. <laughs> That's not just something we're saying, for real. Uh, he'll be there. Um Will and Mickey Addison will be hosting the conference. Uh, Pastor Torian Dames will be there. Israel Wayne will be there. This brother has been a tremendous blessing to me. If you have one book you need to get, you need to get Education, Does God Have an Opinion by Israel Wayne. It will change your life. It will change your life. It's going to be an amazing time there. Uh, there will be other events. I'm just sharing these now. Uh, back in the fall, we'll be traveling Broadcasting live on the road is going to be an amazing, amazing year, really, uh, contending for the glory of God. But before we get too far in all of that, let us turn to the word of God. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 8 is where we're going to go today. Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 8. I want to share this. <clears throat> And in, in, in this portion of Scripture, uh, the Lord just, just put on my heart this morning, and it, it really prompted me to consider, do we really uh, take the Word of God as seriously as we need to? Romans chapter 8, <clears throat> verses 5 through 8. This is what the Word of God says. And remember, this is the Apostle Paul writing to the saints of God, to the Christians in Rome, and he writes this. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind of the flesh, or some translations there say, to be carnally minded is death. But the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. <clears throat> because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God. For it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh, again, those who are carnally minded, cannot please God. Now, before anybody wants to get mad at me, this is not my words. <laughs> this is God's word. The Lord has revealed to us by his spirit, in his word, through the Apostle Paul. For those who are according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. For to be carnally minded, or as it says, for the mindset on the flesh is death. Now I want to stop and pause for a moment. Do we really believe that? Do we really believe to be carnally minded is death? Because in a lot of places, I see lots of professing believers attempting to make room for and to justify carnal mindedness. And I want to be clear about what the scripture is communicating when the Lord highlights carnal mindedness for the mind that is set on the flesh is death. What is the Lord talking about? <clears throat> the mind set on the flesh or the carnal mind thinks continually about and constantly desires the things characteristic of fallen, sinful human nature. That is <laughs> to think the way the unbelieving world thinks, emphasizing what it, what it thinks is important. That, that's the carnal mind. I'm going to say it again. The carnal mind 
or the mind that is set on the flesh thinks continually, continually, nonstop, with very little, if at all, interruption, thinks continually and constantly and desires the things characteristic of fallen, sinful human nature. That is to think the same way the unbelieving world thinks and emphasizing what the unbelieving world says it's important or thinks is important. Unfortunately, brothers and sisters, that characterizes much of the professing church today. And instead of, instead of being convicted by the Spirit of God to recognize what Romans chapter 8 says, specifically verse 6 here, to be carnally minded is death. The mind is set on the flesh is death. We had people in in. And I understand people, they, they, they're trying to throw the bait and all this kind of stuff. You had folks saying, <laughs> this year for our Resurrection Sunday service, we don't want to exclude anybody, so we're not going to have any mention of the cross. We're not to have any mention of Calvary. We're not going to have any mention of repentance. <laughs> oh, Lord. But we want to be inclusive. Inclusive in what? Inviting to what? The Bible says, God is saying to us through his word, for the mindset on the flesh is death. It's not just a lesser way to live or maybe not God's best for you. It's death. But the mindset on the spirit is life. And peace. Isn't it amazing? <laughs> and the Spirit of God through the Apostle Paul is communicating that the mindset on the Spirit being life and peace is not merely something or not limited to what's going to happen in the great by and by. It's life and peace now. The life includes eternal life. The Zoe life portending towards eternal life. But the inclusion of both life and peace refers to the fact that having a mind set on the Spirit of God provides life eternally. Yes, I won't say provides. It's a feature of one who has eternal life. But also peace in the here and now. In the face of all kinds of difficulty, in the face of hostility, in the, in, in, in the face of, of, of persecution, of marginalization, life and peace. Then the Lord explains why through the Apostle Paul. Because the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God. This is, and, I, and I'm sorry to say this, but this is where you get, <laughs> I'm not trying to, I'm certainly not trying to be legalistic, but I want you to understand what's going on. This is where you get the believer, especially some of our younger brothers and sisters in Christ, who the Lord has convicted and they're endeavoring to live holy, where you have other professing believers that say, well, why can't you listen to secular music? Why, why can't you listen to this profane music? Oh, there you go. There you go, wanting to be spiritual again. That's just evidence that we don't believe the carnal mind to be carnally minded is death. And it shows instead of being salt and light, <laughs> we become lightly salted. To where it's not, what must I do to be saved? It's how much can I get away with? How worldly can I really be? I mean, you know, I'm saved, but you know. I'll never forget you had... You had the, uh, I call him Demas, you know, the rapper, Lecrae. He talking about, yeah, I'm a little righteous and ratchet. That might sound cool to the streets, but that's not biblical, man. That doesn't mean that if you were ratchet before you came to Christ, but now that you're in Christ, he transforms us from the inside out. So if you're in Christ, you shouldn't still be ratchet. That's basic. But now, you know, we, you know, we so cool. You know, we got, we got to be, we, we swagged out. And really what we're revealing is that we have hearts that are inclined toward carnality. And what we don't realize is that we allow the world to desensitize us to it. When the facts are we're carnally minded. Now, God knows when we're saved, we don't automatically get new minds, which is why we have the Romans 12 command. 
not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. So I simply want to encourage you, though we're in this world, we're not of this world. And because we're not of this world, let's refuse to allow this world to desensitize us to where we become nose blind to carnality and we find ourselves in a posture trying to justify being carnally minded. Because as a reminder, God says, not a God says to be carnally minded is death. The Written Word of God is a unique, uplifting, and empowering book. Pastor Joseph Parker. The Word of God is alive. It's pregnant with the ability to bless us. It's a book filled with grace. It's a source, a container, a vessel of grace. And every day God's question to each one of us is, how much do you want? The Word of God is Christ, and Christ is the Word of God. When you read the Word of God, the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking to you. He's pouring himself into your mind, body, and spirit. When we read the Word of God, Christ is touching our lives. And as we read the Word of God, he's bringing healing and wholeness to our lives in every part of our lives. One of the most fruitful and wise habits we can start in our lives is the habit of reading and spending time in God's Word every single day. Find encouraging blogs from Pastor Joseph at afa.net slash the stand. Do you believe in total honesty between a husband and wife? I'm not sure I do. With today's Dr. Dobson Minute, here's Dr. James Dobson. It's honest for a man to tell his wife that he hates her cellulite or her varicose veins or the way she cooks. It's honest for a woman to dump her anger on her husband, constantly berating him for his shortcomings and his failures. But honesty that does not have the best interest of the other person at heart is really a cruel form of selfishness. Some couples, in their determination to share every thought and opinion, systematically destroy the sweet aroma of romance that once drew them together. No longer is there any sense of mystique in the relationship. Now, I'm not suggesting that you become deceitful with your husband or wife. I am recommending, however, that you let your anger and frustration cool down just a bit before you pour it on an unsuspecting partner in the name of honesty. For more information, visit drdobsonminute.org. Did you know the abortion pill accounts for over 50% of all abortions? Preborn Ministry continues to stand with women in crisis in their darkest hour and bring hope and life. After Marissa took the abortion pill, she immediately regretted it, but Preborn was there for her. Look at that baby. Look how beautiful he is. Look at that. Abortion pill reversal actually works. Let's hear his heartbeat. Oh, look how strong it is. Oh, praise God. By God's amazing grace, this baby was saved, but many more need our help. To learn how you can be a part of rescuing babies' lives and sharing the heart of Jesus, go to preborn.com. That's preborn.com. Or dial pound 250 and say the keyword baby. That's pound 250 and say baby. Shining light into the darkness, this is the Hamilton Corner on American Family Radio. Welcome back to the Hamilton Corner. Abraham Hamilton III here. I am honored and elated to have on the program with me uh, a man of God who I respect highly, who is uh, first and foremost committed to the cross of Christ and to the the, the truth and the clarity of his word. Uh, in addition to, the, to that, he is excellent, excellent. Uh, and I've said this before, my go-to for all things concerning uh, the environment, concerning science, the, the current debates on climate change, my guest is the president of the Cornwall Alliance for the Stewardship of Creation, which is a ministry dedicated to educating the public and policymakers on biblical earth stewardship, economic development for the poor, and the gospel of Jesus Christ and a Christian worldview. He's the author of over 15 books and thousands of articles, and he recently co-edited with University of Delaware Professor Emeritus uh, of Climatology, Dr. David I don't want to mispronounce his last name, but I should have got this pronunciation before. Dr. David, I'm going to ask Dr. Beisner to tell me how to pronounce it first. <laughs> My guest is Dr. Cal Beisner. Uh, thank you for joining me here on the program, Dr. Beisner. 
Hey, Abe, it's great to be back with you again. Thanks oh, it, so much. It, it's, it is absolutely my pleasure. So the first thing I'm going to ask is how do I pronounce your co-editor's name, last name? Because I don't want to butcher it. It is, it is Legates. Legates. See, that's what I thought. I should have went with my gut. Dr. David Legates. Now, this book, and I, I said this and I mean this. I first want to mention Dr. Beisner's Ministries website is cornwallalliance.org. C-O-R-N-W-A-L-L-A-L-L-I-A-N-C-E dot O-R-G. Uh, many people ask me all the time, hey, where do you go for research? Where do you do these different things? The Cornwall Alliance website is a treasure. It is a treasure uh, because in the midst of all of these conversations that are swirling around us, you know, what is anthropogenic climate change? What is all of these things? What do these phrases mean? Uh, I am so grateful to have a, a resource like the Cornwall Alliance, to help us to make heads or tails of these things, and most importantly, to be anchored by a biblical worldview. Uh, you have been a blessing, really, to the body of Christ and to the world, frankly, by what you and your colleagues do through the Cornwall Alliance. So thank you so much uh, for the ministry that you all diligently uh, pursue to the glory of God. Well, thank you. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate it. And uh, it's been a blessing each time I've been on the show with you, and I'm looking forward to this one. Well, praise God. Well, I want to show the audience I have your most recently edited book, which is number one, last I checked, on the Amazon uh, lists, Climate and Energy, the case, the case, Lord, not the case, the case for realism, co-edited by Dr. Beisner and Dr. David Legates. Dr. Beisner, I know this has been a labor of love. You were invested in this for 18 months and bringing this together. Uh would you just first give us an overview of what this book is and why you and Dr. Legates invested your lives in putting it together? Oh, gee, you're not asking much, are you? <laughs> an of a no, no, book. just 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 your life commitment in about nearly 500 pages of work. Just a little, right. just a little introductory right. question. Right. <laughs> well, I, I think maybe we can just start with the significance of the title: climate sure. and energy. The for realism mm. because really when it comes to climate change issues most people think that everything is either one extreme or the other either uh, climate alarmism climate catastrophism climate change is an existential threat it's code red for humanity whatever like that or climate change denialism it's all a hoax there's no climate change human activity doesn't contribute to climate change no problems whatsoever involved. Now, both of those extremes are simply wrong scientifically, and uh, neither one of them fits well with a biblical uh, worldview that recognizes that since God placed man on earth to subdue it and have dominion over all of it, it's, it's simply wrong to think that human activity cannot have any significant impact on the earth. Our position is that human-induced climate change is real, but it's not likely to be catastrophic. Um, natural cycles of warming or cooling could increase the warming that we've seen in the last 60 to 100 years, or could reverse them. Uh, our contribution may or may not be the primary driver of the warming of the last, say, 60 years, uh, but whatever is the case, the warming that comes from our activities is not going to be catastrophic. But the attempt to slow, stop, or reverse that warming by rapidly transitioning from coal, oil, and natural gas, which currently provide about 85% of all the world's energy, to wind and solar, would be economically disastrous. It would lead to the slowing, the stopping, or the reverse of the conquest of poverty around the world. It would deprive billions of people of uh, getting the electricity that they do not have now, and uh, billions more people of getting the reliable electricity that they don't have now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in. We, we're having sounding, sounds like some technical issues uh, with, with hearing your feed, Dr. Beisner. Yeah. So, so and, and I'd love to, and if we need to, maybe, maybe we need to adjust the connection and how we can connect it. 
Uh, but when you present kind of these these polar opposite positions that would be extremes, I would I would e- express it as extremes on both ends. Either it is the co- climate catastrophist or alarmist disposition, or those who completely disregard the concept as uh, it's all just fanciful. I, I, my my immediate response, immediate question I would have is, how did we get to that place where we have these polar extremes, and would you view one as being responsive to the other um, in terms of their development, those extreme positions being developed? I think we're gonna we're gonna make an, make an adjustment with the connectivity um, because the, there's some something going on with the feed, and I, and I want to um, get to because there was a conversation between the Guyanese president, um, <clears throat> President Muhammad Ephraim Ali, and he had a conversation with a BBC reporter, and I'm gonna wait for uh, Jeff so we get all this squared away. But they're having a conversation about this, and the Guyanese president in, interrupts the BBC reporter and says, you want to lecture me on climate? I'm going to lecture you on climate. And he says some things that a lot of people agree with, sometimes, some things some people disagreed with, and so to make heads or tails of this. And it's also vitally important that we have this conversation uh, because, like it or not, the conversation surrounding climate is affecting policymaking on every front. You know, there's so many things happening. Some of you are like, man, how do we all of a sudden have all of these electric vehicle conversations and all of these uh, vehicle manufacturers are attempting to make to make electric vehicles? How did this happen? Well, it's because they're responding with responding to what is commonly described as as the climate change concern and attempting to abandon the usage of hydrocarbon fuels or are commonly described as fossil fuels. And so why is all of this happening? And it's happening. Things are swirling around us. You know, gas prices, for example, in in California are through the roof. Gas prices in other parts of the country is not merely being impacted by, you know, national policies in terms of oil and things of that nature. Uh, But you also have things taking place to try to minimize the the impact of what's described as carbon emissions and all of these kind of things. And so you have lots of people who are not necessarily scientists, but they have common sense. And they say, wait a minute, now what, some of this stuff is not making any sense at all. And so it's important that we are able to be conversant on the topic, but to be able to do so anchored in a biblical worldview. So I'm, that, that is why I wanted to have Dr. Beisner on, because these things are impacting policy and impacting every, uh, things around us. Like it or not, you know, like it or not, I've long said that I have no problem with the investigation in, you know, what's described as alternative alternative energy sources. But why would we artificially try to bolster this exploration? So now I think we got Dr. Beisner back on. The The, the question that, that I had was that you mentioned kind of the polar opposite positions, climate catastrophism, alarmism versus those who may regard... You know, the climate change conversation is nothing. There's nothing going on there. It's just a hoax. And my, my initial question in that regard was, uh, how do we de- get to this place where we have these kind of binary positions? And is one position, devel- has it developed as a response to the other? Well, uh, that's a big historical question. And we have an entire <laughs> pretty long chapter on the history of the climate change controversy by Dr. Legates. Uh, it's, it's actually pretty complex stuff. Mm. But I think what we see is that really the, the alarm about this, the alarmist case about climate change has always been driven by an agenda to advance uh, global reach of government, um, the tearing down of national sovereignty. Um, I think you can see that by recognizing that In the 1960s and 1970s, the big fear was supposed to be global cooling. We were headed Mm -hmm. for another ice age, Mm -hmm. and this global cooling was going to cause more frequent and more intense hurricanes, droughts, floods, heat waves, (laughs) cold snaps, uh, tornadoes, everything else uh, that you can imagine. 
And then when the climate didn't cooperate with that global cooling notion and we went instead to global warming, we were told, well, global warming is going to cause more hurricanes, droughts, floods, heat waves, cold snaps, tornadoes, etc. All the disasters you can think of. And the, in both cases, whether for global warming or for global cooling, the solution was going to be we have to give control of our economies, particularly of our energy sources, to global treaties, to an increasingly globalized governing structure that would uh, really not be accountable to ordinary people. And so what I think we've seen politically is the use of fears of climate change as a rationale for getting rid of uh, private property rights, free trade, limited government, the rule of law, all of these sorts of things that are characteristic of that awful, awful thing called capitalism. Mm. And we can see that partly in... Mm. I don't know what's going on. We keep ha hitting these spots, just getting getting to the place we can see that partly. Oh, I missed that. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, kind of, uh, Figueres, Figueres, the former chairperson of the UN Framework on, uh, Convention on Climate Change, once said in the lead up to the Paris Climate Summit of 2015, this was the first opportunity that we had to intentionally change the global economic order. And what she was talking about was changing it from a free trade environment to a socialist environment. Mm. So I think that's what drives people toward alarmism. And then we can also say a little bit about the media. Uh, the media all figure that bad news is good news, good news is no news. That's because bad news gets eyeballs, and eyeballs are what you have to have to get advertisers to buy advertising, and that pays your bills. Mm. So the media <laughs> really appreciates scare stories. They don't appreciate, hey, the news is good. Climate change is actually probably going to bring as much benefit as it does harm, maybe even more. And by the way, even if it does bring more harm than good, there are other things that we can do to adapt to it, and fighting it makes no sense whatsoever. Mm. Now, in the past, you and I have had a conversation about even how some of the professional journals and per periodicals uh, won't even allow a, a perspective other than kind of the alarmist narrative to, to be published. Has that contributed uh, to the, I guess, the public presentation, a public persona? as if there is one predominant view on the issue. Yes, absolutely. Um, there was uh, an article published in Nature magazine, uh, Nature, which is one of the two top science journals in the world, uh, last September. And this article was on how climate change affects wildfires in California. The author of that article, the lead author, then after that article appeared, wrote in his own book, Well, I don't I don't know what's going on. There's certain <laughs> the change going on because it it's the 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 feed seems seems to be going in and out, in and out. Are are you there, Doctor Beiser? I am here. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. It went out for a huh. moment there. Okay, he said that what he had to do to get it published was to keep out of it any information that minimized the apparent relevance of climate change to California wildfires. But that information was actually very important. Well, that actually uncovered the fact that for a couple of decades now, the major uh, science journals pretty much refused to publish anything that questions the notion of catastrophic man-made global change. Mm. Now, and you were getting to this point early, and I think you kind of got caught up in, in the connection. And, and you make this point in, in, your, in, your, in, in the book and you mentioned it in the, in the prologue and it's illustrated throughout the book, that adaptation is what you're recommending as opposed to mitigation, which a lot of the efforts are directed toward mitigation. We have about a minute before we have to go to the break. Actually, I'm going to hold that because the disrespectful music has started. I want to get to a point that is made uh, that what needs to occur is that we need to choose adaptation over mitigation. And if we do so, life after climate change will most likely be better 
than it is today or ever has been. I like to pick up right there when we get back on the other side of the break. Uh, you're listening to the Hamilton Corner. My guest is the president of the Cornwall Alliance, Dr. Cal Beisner. We're discussing uh, the new book that he co-edited with Dr. David Legates, who uh, is a professor emeritus in meteorology, if I remember correctly, uh, from the University of Delaware. If I have that wrong, I'm going to correct that. No, it. I'm going to correct that on the other side of the break, but we're discussing the book, Climate and Energy, The Case for Realism. Hey, man, what are you doing? I'm just lying here relaxing in a stream. I call it streaming. Okay, uh, you know that word already has another meaning, right? AFA Streaming offers free and subscription video content. Titles like By Design, The God Who Speaks, and Asbury Revival, Desperate for More. You'll also find video versions of AFR programs. Visit afa.net and click on Streaming. Hello, I'm Don Hawkins, here to tell you about Encouragement Live. 55 minutes of industrial strength radio encouragement featuring resourceful guests plus practical biblical insights to help you face life's challenges. We'll be taking your phone calls. So plan to join us for Encouragement Live, Saturdays at 7.05 p.m. Central, 8.05 p.m. Eastern, here on American Family Radio. Easter. This is David Wheaton, host of The Christian Worldview. How tragic that the most important event in the history of mankind, the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ, has been replaced with a fairy tale about bunnies and eggs. To not know about the person and work of Jesus Christ on the cross and his supernatural resurrection is to be left in the dark about the one way God offers to reconcile sinners to himself. The Bible says it is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Don't be distracted. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Listen to our special Easter program at thechristianrealview.org and then tune in this weekend as Alex Newman joins us to discuss how much the public educational system is changing. Listen to The Christian Worldview with David Wheaton, Saturday mornings at 8 Central on American Family Radio. We live in a day when America's families are under attack like never before. Buddy Smith, Senior Vice President of the American Family Association. The war against biblical principles rages on numerous fronts. The Internet, Hollywood, Washington, D.C., America's corporate boardrooms, and the list goes on. At American Family Association, we're committed to standing against the enemies of God, the enemies of your family. And we recognize it's an impossible task without God's favor and your partnership. Thank you for being faithful to pray for this ministry, to give financially and to respond to our calls for activism. What you do on the home front is crucial to what we do on the battlefront. We praise God for your faithfulness. And may he give us many victories in the battles ahead as we work together to restore our nation's biblical foundations. If we're podcasting and we're talking about God, couldn't we call that Godcasting? Well, I guess we could, but... American Family Radio programs are available for listening at your leisure at AFR.net slash podcasting. Practically every AFR program is posted shortly after it airs and is available anytime you want it on the podcast page at AFR.net. Godcast. Yeah, I don't think it's going to catch on. The Hamilton Quarter Podcast and one-minute commentaries are available at AFR.net. Back to the Hamilton Quarter on American Family Radio. Welcome back to the Hamilton Corner, Abraham Hamilton III, and I am on with my guest, Dr. Cal Beisner, president of the Cornwall Alliance. We are discussing the new book that he co-edited with Dr. David Legates, who is a professor of climatology, climatology, and we're just we're talking about uh, the reality of having a a <laughs> a view on this matter that is not tethered to any polar extreme on the issue, 
but having a perspective that is ultimately anchored by a biblical worldview. And the question that I had before the break, Dr. Beisner, um, is that in the book you discuss, uh, and I'm saying you in particular because you mentioned this in your preface, that the choice that we need to make as, uh, as people is to uh, adapt to what is occurring as opposed to using you know, external, I would say, government-sponsored, government-anchored interventionist uh, me- uh, mechanisms because ultimately adaptation is the way forward to allow us to be more prosperous than we are now, currently, or ever have been historically. Would you explain that, please? Yeah, really, the choice is between adaptation and mitigation. Now, what do we mean by these terms? Well, is the idea that slows or reverse the warming of the global atmosphere? And by the way, I don't say heating, and I don't say it's getting hotter. It's warming. Why do I use that term? Because the differences are measured in tenths of a degree not in tens of degrees. And frankly, that's not something for us to worry about. Mm -hmm. But mitigation means trying to reduce the warming. Adaptation means, well, whatever the temperature is, we can adapt to it. We all know that anyway from the simple fact that from the nighttime low to daytime high, we experience a temperature change of 20, 30, 40 degrees from... (laughs) Winter low to summer high, we experience a difference of perhaps 50 to 70 or or more degrees. So we adapt by building structures that can uh, protect us, by having heating and air conditioning, having proper clothing, all of these things. We can adapt to all of what comes from climate. And the, the cost of trying to limit, trying to reduce global warming, would be probably on the neighborhood of uh, $20 to $30 trillion per year to the global economy by the end of this century. Instead, we can adapt through ways that we're quite good at doing Uh, And that means we can thrive in any climate from the Arctic Circle to the Sahara Desert to the Brazilian rainforest. Uh, But if we're poor, we can't do that. Poverty leaves us vulnerable to weather extremes. Prosperity makes us able to defend ourselves. And that's shown by the fact that over the last hundred years, human mortality rates to extreme weather events have fallen by more than 98 percent. And that's right during the period of so-called man-made global warming that's supposed to be so dangerous. <sighs> this conversation is so frustrating for a host of reasons because the people in our nation and people around the world are being overwhelmingly manipulated. Uh, you have young people that are literally having conversations about refusing to, to procreate in their efforts to, quote-unquote, save the planet. But when you talk about you know, warming as opposed to getting hotter, that it's being measured in, you know, in decimals, not in in, uh, percentages of degrees, not in in entire degrees. It seems to me that the alarmist rhetoric is intentionally promulgated to foment a, a, a disposition that would allow people who are wickedly motivated to use it as an excuse to move towards a kind of uh, totalitarian regimes that you mentioned at the very beginning. Am I overstating that? Uh, No, I don't think you're overstating that at all. That doesn't mean that everybody's motive behind this has something to do with that. But if we look at the history of the population control movement, uh, starting in the uh, 19th century, following the teachings of of, uh, Thomas Robert Malthus, Uh, Mm -hmm. telling people that population would grow faster than food resources, and the opposite has actually turned out to be true. Or the eugenics movement of the late 19th century, the early 20th century, and then uh, the the environmental movement of the 1950s through 1980s or 90s. Population control has always been a major aim of all of this. The top leaders of the world's largest environmental organizations generally agree that optimal human population would be about 300 to 500 million people. That means we have to get rid of about 95% of us. 
And the, the easy way to do that is just simply to make it so that people can't survive. Well, what do you do? You deprive them of the abundant, affordable, reliable energy that is indispensable to lifting and keeping whole societies out of poverty. And to do that, you persuade people that if they continue using that energy, they're going to cause an existential disaster. That's just not true. And that's not even the view of the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which the alarmists say is the world's most august authority on the topic. But you can read through their scientific reports and never get that kind of alarmist existential threat catastrophe language. Their position is much more like our own. Hmm. Man, this is this is this is intriguing. This is intriguing. So when when the term anthropogenic warming is used and you say that, well, we are getting warmer, but it's not anything that is that it's cat- catastrophic. What is it that the science actually shows that we're experiencing? Well, we've had about 1 to 1.1 degrees Celsius warming of global average temperature since about 1850. Um, the, the, is the that in total? Is that per year? 1.1 degrees Celsius? That's total. In total, total since about 1850. Well, um, the warming at a rate of 0.14 degrees Celsius per decade. That would be another 1.4 degrees for a century, okay? (laughs) But we know that there are natural cycles of warming and cooling, and it's uh, probably about time for us to enter a cooling cycle, especially because of affect the formation of clouds, which affects temperature. All of that gets very complicated, and it is discussed in one of the chapters in our book. Uh, but we, we don't need to be concerned about the rate of warming or the magnitude of warming. Warmer periods have been the best periods for human well-being and the life under good for the earth because it feeds plants. Dr. Bajan, the connection continues to go in and out. I'm going to have to have you back on, on another time because so much of what you're saying, the good stuff, we can't hear it all because oh, <laughs> it's being hindered. But I want to mention climate and energy, the case for realism. We will definitely have you on again soon because I want to have this conversation because as you're talking, people are asking questions. They're sending in sending in notes as going on. What, what is contributing? Why is this happening? But when you make the observation that since from 1850 to where we are currently, we're talking about one, but certainly no more than two degrees Celsius for that entire time period, it helps put into, put into a context what we're talking about, why you can say warming, but we're talking about percentages of degrees. We're not talking about degrees and, 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 and massive numbers and as a result of us being able to contextualize the conversation, we, we, everyday people in our interactions, when people tell you that you need to be concerned because the planet is warming, you can respond by saying, now, no, you are aware that since 1850, we're talking less than two degrees Celsius from since 1850 to help us to contextualize the reality that regardless of the temperature, we can adapt to what is going on and refusing to allow the popular narratives on these issues to, be, to make us more readily placed in the direction towards <laughs> Marxist, communist policies that really, when you get right down to the brass taxes where the rubber meets the road, that, that are employed to bankrupt. Not everybody has malevolent intentions, but you do have some people who do and and I and I've I've said this before. I don't believe all people who are alarmist concerning climate are also are also uh, depopulationists. But you will find often where you find climate alarmism, you will also find depopulationists. And so, 
this is something we also need to be aware of because when you think about the type of carnage and the type of catastrophe that will result not from the climate but from the interventionist efforts to, to you know, quote-unquote mitigate, then you could recognize, well, decimating eco- economies will, may fit with what they're trying to do. The, the failure to have a biblical worldview, the failure to have a biblical worldview on these issues may not necessarily just be a coincidental phenomenon. And again, I don't want to. I, I don't want to uh, be obtuse in this. I don't want to paint with a broad brush. Like I said, I don't believe all climate alarmists are depopulationists. But you often find where you have alarmism, you also have people that will say, "We have too many people on the planet. We have to." You remember the 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 guys clip we played the other day? We have to civilly move toward, you know, an ideal number of people in the planet. Like, what do you mean civilly? You talking about civilly eliminating people? Now, I want you to hear this exchange uh, between the Guyanese president and BBC reporter. I have his name here. Uh, BBC reporter Stephen Sakur, because there are lots of things that were said in this interview that were, were good. But then there were other things like, mm, I don't know what if you really understand what you're saying, whether or not you should embrace it. It's clip number one. Let's take a big picture look at what's going on here. Over the next uh, decade, two decades, it is uh, expected that there will be $150 billion worth of oil and gas extracted off your coast. It's an extraordinary figure. But think of it in practical terms. That means, according to many experts, more than 2 billion tonnes of carbon emissions will come from your seabed, from those reserves, and be released into the atmosphere. I I don't know if you as a head of state went to the COP in Dubai. Let me stop you right there. Do you know that Guyana has a forest forever that is the size of England and Scotland combined? A forest that stores 19.5 gigatons of carbon? A forest that we have kept alive? A forest that we have kept alive. Does that give you the right? No, Does no, that no, no. give you I, that, the right that, to release that, that all of this carbon? Right? Does from... that give you the right to, to lecture us on climate change? I am going to lecture you on climate change because we have kept this forest alive that stores 19.5 gigatons of carbon that you enjoy, that the world enjoy, that you don't pay us for, that you don't value, that you don't see a value in, that the people of Guyana has kept alive. Guess what? We have the lowest deforestation rate in the world. And guess what? Even with our greatest exploration of the oil and gas resource we have now, we will still be uh, net zero. Guyana will still be net zero. With all our exploration, a couple of we'll points. still be net zero. No, no, there's no, no, no powerful, no, powerful no, no, words, no, no, Mr. President. Hold, 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 hold. But a, a couple. I, I'm not completed as yet. I am not finished as yet. I am just not finished as yet. Because this is the hypocrisy that exists in the world. We, the world in the last 50 years, has lost 65% of all its biodiversity. We have kept our biodiversity. Are you valuing it? Are you ready to pay for it? When is the developed world going well, to pay for it? Or are you, you in the pockets? You, are you in the pockets of those who have damaged the environment? Now, the Guyanese president had lots of things to say, but there are also lots of things that were, were, were good. You know, he's talking about hypocrisy concerning the climate, but at the same time, he then says, well, are you ready to pay for our preservation of our forests? And he, and he goes on to say that we've maintained our, our biodiversity, and even with our off-coast uh, oil drilling, we still will maintain net zero. Is net zero something we should be trying to pursue? You know? Now, the notion that they can pursue the exploration of, you know, what's commonly described as fossil fuels while also maintaining, you know, a a proper approach to the the environment is one (laughs) that is worth having a conversation about. But my concern is that you have some good things mixed with, you know, popular notions that are included in kind of an alarmist worldview that need to be teased out. But the major thing that I want you guys to know is that, as Dr. Bajner said, warming is not synonymous with with being hot. Climate and energy, the case for realism, is available everywhere books are sold. It's number one on Amazon. You can get it co-edited by Dr. Cal Bajner and Dr. David Legates.